Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor-Klaus and Diane Dempster, co-creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award-winning blog, and service organization, helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Elaine and Diane are certified coaches with personal experience raising children with challenges such as ADHD, anxiety, and more, and extensive experience in guiding parents to raise their complex kids with confidence and calm. On the podcast, Elaine and Diane interview experts, bringing you cutting-edge information about your child's challenges, teach you real-life strategies to create lasting change, and demonstrate how coaching can guide you to parent your complex kids one conversation at a time. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to another fabulous conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. Um, We're thrilled to have a new colleague today. Brittany, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your last name, so you get to say it. You could say Brusso or Brusso, whatever. Brusso or... I wish I could say it when you said that. (laughs) Brittany Brusso, who is an ADHD coach who works specifically with kids and teaches kids and does classes for kids. And so we are going to take a shift today as parents and look at what's important for us in terms of conversing with kids and empowering our kids to take ownership of themselves. So... Anything else yeah, you want so to say, Brittany, Dara, before why don't you just, Yeah, I was just going to say, Brittany, why don't you just start by kind of talking a little bit about how you got involved in this work and a little bit about what you do? Yeah. Well, actually, the funny story is that it all started with pandemic boredness. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how it all started. I've always loved working with kids. I used to teach swimming lessons and was a lifeguard and worked with kids who were neurodiverse in that. And then... Basically, the pandemic happened. I finished my psychology degree and couldn't really get a job because nothing was happening. And I got bored. And in true ADHD fashion, I was I thought, okay, I got to figure out something to do. First, I started teaching English online. All right. And then from there, I found the platform OutSchool. Okay. And I know that I've always worked with neurodiverse kids. I also have ADHD and I leaned a little bit into my psychology degree. And I just thought, hey, how cool would it be to create resources for young people who need to learn about their brains? Yeah, that's kind of how I offered my first class. And it went really well. And I thought, oh, wow, I really like this. And then found some excellent coaching programs so I could get that more education and improve. And it kind of just snowballed Unfolded. after that wow. yeah. from there <laughs> so let me ask you a question how how young were you when you were identified or because you you identify as an adult with ADHD right yeah how young were you when you knew that I got my diagnosis when I was in the 11th grade after two years of going to I basically was My mom says I'm her little self-advocate because I did it all myself. (laughs) I went to the school resource center. I went and I was speaking with everybody. I got it all set up for myself because I looked around and I realized I'm working so much harder. It seems like the people around me and I'm getting half the grades and I just don't understand. And there's got to be something else going on because I refuse to believe that I'm stupid. Right. Excellent. I love that. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. I love that so much. So I hear that you advocated to get your own diagnosis, which is yes. pretty unusual, but it does yes. happen. We definitely hear these stories. And so, cause here's what's jumping at me is oftentimes parents are struggling with wanting their kids to understand their diagnosis, but the kid's not really interested. And it's kind of like, leave me alone, mom or dad. Yeah. Right. And so you're talking about like getting in there with the kids and helping the kids kind of own their brains. Well, and and, and I must have wanted that. And so that translates. Go ahead. Well, and the other, the other lens of this is so many parents are like afraid of their kids getting labeled. It's like this sort of, I don't, I've I've, a parent this week whose kid got diagnosed. They're trying to figure out what do I share with them? Do I share anything with them? This kid went through a psych educational evaluation. So Obviously, know something's, something, up. Yeah. something's going on, but it's like there's sort of one parent, like I don't want them to be labeled. The other parents, I don't want them to feel like their self-esteem is being brought down. I mean, there's all these different variables to take into consideration, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think people have very strong opinions on labeling and, you know, the way that I see it is I think that the label is just, you know, 
it's naming your brain, right? Why wouldn't we want to know more about our brain? And I think that often, you know, they're already experiencing it, right? They're, they're living it every day and they understand that something is going on, right? Kids are very observant. They know more than we think they know. Yeah. They're hearing the little conversations that you're having in the corner about them, right? They're hearing about the email that the teacher sent you about how they're having a hard time in class, right? They're seeing their teacher treat them differently or they're they're able to compare that difference. And so the way that I see it is the more negative impact on their self-esteem is not explaining to them that there's actually a wiring difference in their brain. Yeah. I, I love that. I, you know, I often say if kids, if we don't tell them what's going on, what they're going to make up is a whole lot worse. They're going to make up that they're lazy, crazy or stupid. Exactly. Right. And that's kind of what you're saying. You were like, but I'm not stupid. Yeah. Right. So yeah. something's got to be going on. And, and I'll tell you, when I was at, at that age, I thought I was fooling everybody and I really was stupid, but they were just telling me I wasn't. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we don't want our kids to feel that way. So, so tell us a little bit more about, you know, how do the kids respond to this when, cause you work with kids of all ages, little kids, middle, middle school, teenagers, yeah. how do they respond to this messaging you're talking about? Well, every kid is different, right? It's not going to give the same energy from everyone, but I all, what I've noticed is that, I mean, they stick around and the kids who stick around for a while, right. Even the ones who, you know, the first couple of weeks just sat and did nothing and didn't respond. I'm yeah. always surprised when all of a sudden, you know, they start raising their hand or they start, you know, having things to say. And I find that the little ones respond very well, believe it or not. Like the, the seven to 10 year olds are so pumped. They're yeah. so excited. OK, <laughs> they're so excited. How much do they actually are they actually absorbing? I don't always know. Right. All I hear is the positive impact that their parents tell me that they have. So yeah. that's always a win. Uh, the teens also tend to be really involved uh, because it's a social group for them. Sometimes the 10 to 13 year olds, it's hit or miss. Right. Yeah. But more often that than not, it's I'm, just hit or miss no matter what. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> exactly. They're figuring out so much about themselves. They're figuring out their self-identity. They're figuring out so much of what's going on that it can be really hurt, hit or miss. But in general, I'm regularly shocked by these amazing realizations that they have, or they'll come out with these comments or these things or these perspectives. And I think, whoa, you know, how old are you again? I can't right. believe that. <laughs> Yeah. And so I think that, you know, there's going to be some weeks where if they don't really connect with the topic that we're talking about or the because th I do themes of the week, if that's not one that they really see themselves having a struggle with, they might be a little less involved. But when there's one that really gets them, they'll jump right in and they have their perspective because they feel heard and they feel understood and everybody wants that. Right. Yeah. So one of the things you were telling us before we started was that what you'd kind of do differently. A lot of people, you know, we've had conversations on this podcast about how do you talk to your kids about mm -hmm. and you're kind of flipping it on its head and saying, how do kids talk to their parents about? Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that kind of philosophy of helping kids explain their brains. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in self-advocacy. Right. And I think that like the strongest vow of confidence that we can give a kid is telling them, I trust you to be able to give me your perspective on the world. Right. I believe, you know, everybody is the expert on their own experience. Excellent. Right? Yeah. They are the expert on their own experience. And when if and this is what I tell them, I, I I basically one of the things that I teach is I I explain to them that, you know, as a person who is neurodiverse, you have certain rights that are you should always have fulfilled. Right. You have the right to love. You have the right to support. You have the right to feel heard. You have a right to be included in the conversation of revolving around your own needs. But you also have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It is your responsibility to do your best to communicate your needs. It is your responsibility to take full advantage and use to the best of your ability the accommodations that you are given. It is your responsibility to do your work. It is your responsibility to acknowledge when others are trying to help you, right? It is your Love responsibility that. to not expect other people to read your mind, right? So I want to hone in on one of those because we hear this a lot, right? The kids who are like, but I don't want accommodations. How do you speak to kids, particularly teenagers, I'm guessing, 
who were getting at that place who were like, I don't want to take meds or I don't want to come. I don't want to feel different. How do you speak to them around that? I mean, the way that I kind of explain it to them is I get really real about the fact that, you know, we live in a world that is built tech really for neurotypical people. Right. And yeah. we are expected that we still have to reach these same goals because we do. We still have to get up in the morning and brush our teeth and take care of ourselves and get our homework done. But we're taught to do that in a neurotypical way. And then when that doesn't work for us because we're not neurotypical, we're made to feel less than or like we can't do it in the same way. And the way that I explained it to them, it's it's not that it's the the concept is often that their peers will look at them and they'll say, oh, you're getting the easy way out. Right. Mm. And it's not the easy way out. We're getting to the same end point. It's just our road to get there is different. Right. And I say it's okay. So I I give them specific examples for myself. I'm very open and honest about sharing my own experience with my learners because I think that that's, it's great for them to see somebody else who's doing it, right? So I use the example of the fact that I don't cook, even though society says that I should have to cook, I don't cook because I don't want to go to the grocery store. I don't want to plan to cook. I don't want to drive my car to go to the grocery store. I don't want to clean up after I cook. So I pay for a meal service. I pay for help with that because you know what? I have to eat healthy because that's in line with my goals, but I don't have to do it in the neurotypical way. I, she's my new best friend. <laughs> From somebody who is now 30 years in a marriage where I don't cook, I totally respect what you're saying. And, you know, we often say in the ADD world, play to your strengths and outsource your challenges, right? And so what you're saying is you're teaching these kids to say, here's my strength. Let's lean into that. And here are the things I could use some help with that. Why do I have to struggle through that? Exactly. Well, and what's coming up for me is you're saying that, Elaine, and we've, we've talked about this on another podcast, but, you know, we're very focused as a society, more focused as a society on accommodations for kids at school, but you're talking about accommodations for life. I mean, you're talking about shopping and, and cooking and all these other sorts of things. And I think that helping kids understand this is something that I'm good at, or this is not something that I'm good at. And yeah. it's not necessarily because of my neurodiversity, even, you know, it's a sort of, we, we condition kids to think they're supposed to be good at everything as opposed to find what you like and find what you like and outsource the rest. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's also why I do a lot of, I do a lot of strength based coaching exercises as well. Right. We have a lot of conversations around, you know, the concept of we're often not, we don't realize what our strengths are because if it's easy for us, it's just easy. Right. Even though by definition, if something is easy, that means you're good at it. Right. And so if you're doing it well, anyway, <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. exactly. And if, you, and if you ask parents to say, well, what are the things that your kid kids good at? But, well, all they want to do is video games. Well, OK, so take it a step further and yeah. say, what, well, is, what it? is it about the video gaming or what is it about mm-hmm. dinosaurs or what is it about, you know, whatever it is that your kids jazzed about? You can find their passion and their strength in the thing that they're doing more than anything else. Exactly. That's how I get around the whole, oh, because often you ask kids, what are their strengths? And they go, oh, video games. I'm like, okay, that's not the type of strengths that we're going for here. That's a skill. But what strengths make you good at video games? And they're like, oh, I'm a quick thinker. I am, you know, adventurous. I'm creative. I'm, you know, a hard worker. I stick with it. And those are all exactly. And so that's where there's a lot that goes into what makes them so good at video games, right? There's that aspect of it. And when, and that's also how I'm able to get them to engage because anything goes, right? Anything goes, you're using video game as an example. Awesome. If that's how it makes sense to you, let's go with it. Yeah. So one of the things I want to circle back, because you had said you help kids explain their brains to their parents, because Mm -hmm. if they can tell their parents, then they can advocate for themselves. Can you give us an example of, of how you might help a kid describe or talk to their parents about what's going on in their brains? Yeah. So for the younger ones, I do more. I mean, they're they're always able to kind of express themselves in the way that they want to. So if they want to draw it, that's fine. If they want to write it, that's fine. Right. But with the younger ones, I do a lot of, you know, art or creative activities where I say, so for example, if we're talking about what it feels like for them when they're in excitement overwhelm, okay. I ask them to draw it. I'm just like, draw something that represents what it feels like for you. 
And then basically from there, I ask them to explain it to the group and everyone discusses. And then I say, okay, now go, now go show your parent that. And it's something as simple as opening that conversation because maybe they're going to say something to their mom or their dad and their mom or dad is going to go, whoa, I never realized that that's what you're feeling inside. Right. Yeah. And so that's the way that I like to do it. <laughs> right. So, so give us some more. I love that example of excitement overwhelm, like just the concept there of helping kids become aware that sometimes when you get excited about something, you get overwhelmed. Yeah. Like, so what are some of the concepts that, that you share with them or encourage them to share with parents? Um, so I also, another one, we do a lot of emotion regulation conversations. So one mm -hmm. of the really big ones that I bring up a lot is I call it the emotion volcano which you can use for any emotion, positive emotions, negative emotions, right? Angry, sad, excited. And basically we kind of draw a volcano and we yeah. level off different levels in our volcano. And at the top, it explodes, right? right? The volcano explodes, okay? When you get up there, we've lost all access to our logical brain, right? And it's about naming our emotions as they build mm -hmm. and figuring out how our emotions are changing as we get up in the level and talking about, you know, how we can kind of be more in tune with where we at, where we're at in our emotion volcano so that we can hopefully, you know, when we get Avoid. to like level yeah. three, realize, okay, this is the moment where I need to start doing some of that self-care. And, and so instead of letting it get to the red zone, you know, green, yellow, red, instead of yeah. letting it get to the red zone, we're more trying to avoid going to the red zone because we're doing our self-care when we still have access to our logical brain. Well, and what's coming up as you're saying that is just even the language, right? Being able to, I mean, the, not everybody loves the red, yellow, green, but it's something that people can relate to. There's so many challenges with names for emotions. We just don't, as a society, it, there's lots of great words for emotions. Yeah. I'm reading Brene's, Brene Brown's new book on emotional language, um, Atlas of the Heart. But as a society, we just don't have yeah. those names in our vocabulary. Yeah. So that's really powerful. Yeah, that's why I've sometimes I did the activity where sometimes like they can name the levels anything they want. One time, one of my one of the learners chose different Disney characters and every level was a different Disney character. I like and that. they could explain to me why it was the different Disney characters. Right. And then the top one was, you know, this big villain in their right. favorite show. And it was just interesting. Well, and that's what I was going to ask is, do you see patterns of what the, the steps tend to be? Like, have you done, do you have enough where you can pull back and observe and say, okay, typically it starts with this emotion, this, this, like, can you capture it? Yeah, it typically, you know, they will all start with their kind of, you know, frustrated, right? And then they have uh -huh. all their levels. But the common thing that I notice is that it's not an uncommon thing for them to say, I go to one and then I skip two and three and all of a sudden I'm at four. Yeah. Right. And it's that aspect of it that's so true with our with our brains because we're so emotional and we're so it just, you know, our impulsive emotion heightened brains that we just skip it and we go right to it. And that's where we kind of stop. And we realize there is a moment where it's building. It's just, we're not in tune with our bodies yet. Right. We're not in tune yeah. with actually looking inward and that's the skill that we practice. So I yeah. think that it's the common emotion dysregulation that is happening. It's what we skip the middle. They just, you know, they don't pay attention to the middle. They're like, I'm still fine. I'm still fine. No, I'm not fine. But they, yeah. it's about being more aware as it's building to try and name it. Oh, I'm at a three right now. Oh, I'm at a two right now. And so that's where I'll then give them, send them into a challenge of the week where I say, okay, this week when you're feeling something, just check in and say, okay, I'm at a two or I'm at a three. And tell, if you're having a conversation with your parents, you know, and you're starting to get flustered, say, hey, mom, I'm at, I'm at a two right now, by the way. Right. Mm -hmm. And then that's also where parents can kind of help them out and say, what, where are you on your volcano right now? right? Yeah. Just to kind of gauge where they're at in their emotions. Because if they're at a four or they're at a five and they're telling you that they're at a four or a five, one, great at self-advocacy and we love to see it. And right. two, they're past the point in reasoning. Nobody is reasoning anything, whether they have ADHD or not, when their volcano is exploding. Right. Right. Well, and so many parents, we talk about this a lot, are triggering off their kids or their kids are triggering off their parents. And that's sort of the parents' volcanoes going off and that's making the kids' volcano go off. And yeah. I mean, all of those different moving pieces, right? 
Absolutely. I can see some some really uh, some cool. We have some follow up conversation to have about pulling together our anatomy of the trigger with your volcano and seeing what we and can making it a volcano. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this say back to one of the questions I love to ask on this podcast is what do you think parents are most missing in this conversation with their kids about their brains? I think that. So this is my whole presentation at Chad. It's the actually listening, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the actually sitting back and hearing you and listening and instead of telling, right? Or waiting to talk. Or waiting or, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it's, you got to sometimes, a lot of the times they just don't feel heard. I have so many learners who will come and, you know, they're grounded or they're in trouble and they're so mad about it. I'm like, are you mad because you're grounded? And they can tell me they're like, nah, I, it makes a lot of sense. I did something wrong. Well, okay, why are you so angry? And they said, well, because I just wanted to say what I wanted to say. And I wasn't even allowed to say what I wanted to say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now being heard and being seen and being recognized is one of the most profound things that we parents can offer to our kids. Yeah. And we forget that they're independent human beings. And the expert on their own experience. Yeah. They're the expert on their own experience. They're, they're, they're your best resource into their own brain because they're the only ones who know exactly what's going on up there. It's so true. I cannot tell you how many times over the years I've said to parents when they've said something, I'm like, well, have you asked your child? Yeah. Oh, no, I never, never thought to do that. <laughs> yeah. Like, really? You hadn't thought that. I know. <laughs> it's huge. Well, Brittany, I, I hate to say it, but I told you this was going to be fast and our time mm. is running, running down. So will you let us know how people can find out more about you? So I do have a website, which is discoveringmeandadhd.com. Discovering so me and ADHD.com. Yeah. So they can Excellent. check me out on there. There's also um, a link to my out school profile on there, which is the platform that I offer my classes on. Um, right. but I also do uh, private coaching as well. And I also have Instagram, which is at discovering me and ADHD. Haven't been that active on there recently, but it is going to get ramped up. We're working I on it. I love it. it. I, I, think have, it will be I now. have a plan. I have a plan. <laughs> so that you can also Excellent. find me on there. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So what have we missed? If you're, you know, is there one more thing that you want to make sure that we talk about before we end our conversation today? Or anything you want to go back and highlight, yeah, highlight, whichever. Yeah. What do you want I to make sure? I always, always, always like to highlight that. I think that we underestimate kids and I think that we forget that they are these amazing you know, they're, they're learning so much every day and they, they want to learn. And I think the best piece of advice is, you know, let them be where they are in their journey, right? Don't make them do their journey in the way you think they should help them on their own personal journey. It's their yeah. relationship with their brains. It's not your relationship with their brains at the end of the day. For sure. Could not, could not have echoed that any better. I love that. Okay. As we wrap, do you have a favorite quote or motto, something that you want to share? Yeah, I really, I really like, well, I have two. Well, one's more like a new one, but you can, I really, you can share I, both. You can you've have probably two. heard, you've probably heard me say it a bunch of times, right? And it's, you know, everybody is the expert on their own experience. And so yeah. that definitely is a really big one for me. And it's also how I got through a lot of imposter syndrome because, you know, I'm the expert on my own experience. No one can tell me that how I'm experiencing the world is wrong. That's you right. can't, you don't, you don't have to agree with it. Right. Right. Exactly. But my experience is my experience and nobody yeah. can take that from me. So everyone is the expert on their own experience. And also recently, and I had it written down of who said it, but I forget. And it's don't give up what you want most for what you want today. Don't give up what you want most for what you want today. That's been a big one that I've been leaning on a lot working on impulse control recently. So I love that. You know, I had a, one of my kids, extended family kids used to say, I'm borrowing happiness from tomorrow. <laughs> That's beautiful. But it's kind of the flip. Like what yeah. you're saying is don't borrow happiness from tomorrow. Don't yeah. give up on what you want. That's true. Those That's for true. what you want today. Yeah. Which I, I think yours is a little wiser. I think, Yeah. you know, his maybe not so, but it was funny. But it is funny. No, it's cute. <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So Brittany, it's been great to get to know you a little bit better. Thank you so much for joining us today and what you're doing with kids and um, appreciate you and are glad that you've been with us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. This Truly was so a much pleasure. fun. Thank Such you. A and great conversation. And thank you for having me on and giving me the opportunity to share what I do. It was lovely. 
truly a, a pleasure and, and I'm looking forward to knowing you more. Yes, and, and to those of you who are tuned in and listening, thank you for being here, for caring and paying attention and listening to yourself and to your kids and, and for what you're doing. You make a difference and we'll talk to you on the next show. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.